Chapter Ten of the Voyages of Doctor Doolittle by Hugh Lofting. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Private Zoo. I did not think there could be anything left in that garden which we had not seen, but the doctor took me by the arm and started off down a little narrow path, and after many windings and twistings and turnings, we found ourselves before a small door in a high stone wall. The doctor pushed it open. Inside was still another garden. I had expected to find cages with animals inside them, but there were none to be seen. Instead, there were little stone houses here and there all over the garden, and each house had a window and a door. As we walked in, many of these doors opened, and animals came running out to us, evidently expecting food. Haven't any of the doors locks on them? I asked the doctor. Oh, yes, he said. Every door has a lock. But in my zoo, the doors open from the inside, not from the out. The locks are only there so the animals can go and shut themselves in any time they want to get away from the annoyance of other animals, or from people who might come here. Every animal in this zoo stays here because he likes it, not because he is made to. They all look very happy and clean, I said. Would you mind telling me the names of some of them? Certainly. Well, now, that funny looking thing with plates on his back, nosing under the brick over there, is a South American armadillo. The little chap talking to him is a Canadian woodchuck. They both live in those holes you see at the foot of the wall. The two little beasts doing antics in the ponds are a pair of Russian minks. And that reminds me, I must go and get them some herrings from the town before noon. It is early closing today. That animal just stepping out of his house is an antelope, one of the smaller South African kinds. Now let us move to the other side of those bushes there, and I will show you some more. Are those deer over there? I asked. Deer? said the doctor. Where do you mean? Over there, I said, pointing, nibbling the grass border of the bed. There are two of them. Oh, that, said the doctor with a smile. That isn't two animals. That's one animal with two heads, the only two headed animal in the world. It's called the Pushmi Pulyu. I brought him from Africa. He's very tame, acts as a kind of night watchman for my zoo. He only sleeps with one head at a time, you see. Very handy. The other head stays awake all night. Have you any lions or tigers? I asked as we moved on. No, said the doctor. It wouldn't be possible to keep them here, and I wouldn't keep them even if I could. If I had my way, Stubbins, there wouldn't be a single lion or tiger in captivity anywhere in the world. They never take to it. They're never happy. They never settle down. They are always thinking of the big countries they have left behind. You can see it in their eyes, dreaming, dreaming always of the great open spaces where they were born, dreaming of the deep, dark jungles where their mothers first taught them how to scent and track the deer. And what are they given in exchange for all this? asked the doctor, stopping in his walk and growing all red and angry. What are they given in exchange for the glory of an African sunrise, for the twilight breeze whispering through the palms, for the green shade of the matted, tangled vines, for the cool, big starred nights of the desert, for the patter of the waterfall after a hard day's hunt? What, I ask you, are they given in exchange for these? Why, a bare cage with iron bars, an ugly piece of dead meat thrust into them once a day, and a crowd of fools come to stare at them with open mouths. No, Stubbins. Lions and tigers, the big hunters, should never, never be seen in zoos. The doctor seemed to have grown terribly serious, almost sad. But suddenly his manner changed again, and he took me by the arm with his same old cheerful smile. But we haven't seen the butterfly houses yet, nor the aquariums. Come along. I'm very proud of my butterfly houses. Off we went again, and came presently into a hedged enclosure. Here I saw several big huts made of fine wire netting, like cages. Inside the netting, all sorts of beautiful flowers were growing in the sun, with butterflies skimming over them. The doctor pointed to the end of one of the huts, where little boxes with holes in them stood in a row. Those are the hatching boxes, said he. There I put the different kinds of caterpillars, and as soon as they turn into butterflies and moths, they come out into these flower gardens to feed. Do butterflies have a language? I asked. Oh, I fancy they have, said the doctor, and the beetles, too. But so far I haven't succeeded in learning much about insect languages. I have been too busy lately trying to master the shellfish talk. I mean to take it up, though. At that moment, Polynesia joined us and said, Doctor, there are two guinea pigs at the back door. 
They say they have run away from the boy who kept them because they didn't get the right stuff to eat. They want to know if you will take them in. All right, said the doctor. Show them the way to the zoo. Give them the house on the left, near the gate, the one the black fox had. Tell them what the rules are, and give them a square meal. Now, Stubbins, we'll go on to the aquariums. And first of all, I must show you my big glass seawater tank where I keep the shellfish. End of chapter 10